Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again. Well, one of the things I'd like to ask you at this time is, how are you doing? How is your spiritual life? What are the challenges that you are going through? Are there blessings that have come your way? Are there difficulties that have come your way? Uh, have you received a promotion or a new job opportunity? Or have you lost a job? I mean, I'm talking about a myriad of life experiences. And so some of us are weeping and some of us are rejoicing. Some of us are, are wailing and some of us are laughing. I am so sure that when we see all the people in the world, we will see a myriad of reactions, expressions, and uh, responses to all these uh, different circumstances that take place in our lives. Now, the question, of course, is wh whatever we go through, how should we respond? Is there a common response that we should have? Well, I believe there should be a common response, and the common response is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, wherein it says, In everything, Give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so it doesn't really matter whether it's sunshine or rain or whether it's a downpour or a drought. The Bible says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So that, dear friends, is our common response. It doesn't matter what we're going through. We know, after all, that our God is sovereign. He rules and reigns. He permits and He ordains. And therefore, everything is in His divine control. And if only for that reason, shouldn't we be worshiping the Lord? Let's now rise and worship God.
I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your holy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and extol your glorious name forever and ever. I will give thanks to you.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of today's sermon is Looking at the Bright Side. We will take our text from Matthew 17, verses 22 to 23. Let us read this passage. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Shall we bow our heads in prayer at this time? Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you that you rule over our lives. You ruled in the past, you continue to rule in the present, and you will rule in the future. And we thank you, Lord, because such sovereignty brings assurance in our hearts that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, you will never abandon us. And so, Lord, we thank you for the blessed assurance of your presence. And today, once again, we desire that you minister to us through the power of your Spirit. I pray that you might illumine the Word of God before your people, that we might understand your will. Allow me to communicate it, Lord, in a manner that not only makes it understandable, but will bring conviction to each and every heart. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, the passage that we will be dealing with today is looking at the bright side of dark times. Allow me to share a little story. I recall the story of one Christian by the name of Eugene Clark. He is known as a songwriter. But one of the most powerful testimonies in his life is that he viewed suffering from a right perspective. He was afflicted with severe rheumatoid arthritis and glaucoma. And Clark spent the last 10 years of his life bedridden. 
Yet he continued composing songs and writing articles to the glory of God. His music continued to enrich the lives of countless thousands through the ministry on Back to the Bible. Though down physically, he learned to keep looking up. And I think that's one of the challenges that you and I have as believers in Christ when we encounter adversities and trials and difficulties in our lives. We tend to become depressed. We tend to become despondent. We tend to become frustrated during those difficult times in our lives, during those dark times. And so it is a challenge for us to, to really look at the bright side of things. But then again, we have to understand that the God that we serve rules and reigns. He ruled in the past, He rules now, and He will continue to rule in the future. And I believe that fact in itself should somehow bring an assurance in our lives that for as long as we are walking according to God's will, all will be well with us. And so, friends, whenever you go through dark and difficult times, have that attitude of looking at the bright side. Now, I don't know exactly what you are going through in your life right now. It may be that you're going through a very difficult situation in your life, and somehow this is something that is tormenting your soul. I believe if there's one passage that could encourage you, it is the passage that we will be studying today. And so here are three things we will see in these two verses. First of all, in verses 22 to 23a, we will see the coming darkness. And then in verse 23b, we will look at the coming daylight. And finally, in verse 23c, we will see the present downheartedness. So let's talk about the coming darkness as we read verses 22 to 23a at this time. And it reads, And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. Now here we find that Jesus speaks of his coming death and resurrection. By the way, the phrase Son of Man, as we know, is the title of the Messiah. So by God's sovereign plan and permission, Jesus, the Messiah, would be handed over into the hands of men. And so we have to understand that what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ did not happen as a matter of random chance or what we would normally call as coincidence. But rather, this was really part of the sovereign plan of God. This was really part of God's mission for mankind. And as such, this is not to be taken as a coincidence or a case of bad luck. Again, God was ruling and reigning from his heavenly throne, and he was orchestrating all these events, most especially the events that would take place in the life of the Son of Man. Now, I have a question for you because I believe this is a question that needs to answer, to be answered rather. What do you think should happen when the divine gets handed over to humanity? We expect that the divine would be revered, would be honored, would be loved, and would be obeyed. And so that is what we expect. So when Jesus Christ was handed over to men, these are the things that we feel should be done or should happen in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, did it really happen? Was Jesus revered? Was he honored? Was he loved? Was he obeyed? Well, I think the Lord knew already what was going to happen, and that is why he spoke in a parable to somehow declare in a picture the things that would actually happen to him. 
And so I'd like to bring you to Matthew 21, beginning at verse 33. And this is what it says in Matthew 21, verse 33. It says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. Now, when the harvest time approached, he sent the slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers uh, took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. Now, what exactly was the Lord Jesus Christ trying to teach here in this parable? Well, he is teaching that God the Father sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to the nation of Israel to bring their hearts back to God, to bring them into a condition of repentance so that God might be able to restore them. And so we would think that the prophets would be treated well, that they would be respected, that they would be revered, that they would be honored, and whatever they say would be obeyed. However, as history tells us, I'm talking about Israelite history, we find that many of the prophets were not honored. In fact, there were some who were beheaded, some who were sawn in two, some who were stoned, some who were arrested. And so that is what happens in the first part of this parable. Now we move on. Let's uh, read once again what this parable says in verse 37. It goes, But afterward he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they, had, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize him his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? So what do you think the Lord is teaching once again in this parable? So after all the prophets had been sent, and, and the final prophet, by the way, before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was John the Baptist, and we know what happened to him. He was beheaded. Now God the Father sends his only begotten son, the prophet of prophets, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. And so once again, because now God the Father sends his only begotten son, Someone who is fully God and fully man, someone who is truly God and truly man, therefore, the expectation is they, that they would respect the Son of Man. But as we very well know, in the prediction that Jesus makes, he is basically stating, no, I will not be honored. I will not be revered. I will not be worshipped. I will not be obeyed. I will suffer in the hands of men. Sadly, when the divine Messiah gets handed over to men, man would murder him. Incidentally, uh, Judas was present during this conversation, and he was going to be responsible in handing over Jesus to be arrested. Now, this should have somehow caused him to repent, but his heart had already hardened beyond repair. And that is a sad thing here because I believe that by Jesus stating this, he was practically reaching out to Judas, making him aware that he knew exactly what was going to be done to him and what's, what was going to be done by, by Judas himself. And therefore, it was a way of somehow bringing conviction into the heart of Judas. But you and I know that his heart had already been hardened. And we know that eventually he was personally possessed by Satan himself. And that happened. Why? Because he was no longer open to spiritual illumination. He was no longer open to the truth that the Son of God was presenting. 
his heart had been so hardened that he was no longer seeing the Son of God. He was no longer seeing the Messiah, the Anointed One. For him, Jesus was merely a man. Jesus was merely an opportunity for him to gain money, for him to get out of some difficulty in his life. So he saw Jesus as merely an opportunity for himself. And that is why he was more than willing to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what great, sad tragedy this is. That man, even as glory is revealed to him, would refuse that glory. Would even despise and hate that glory revealed to us. And that is exactly what you and I have seen all throughout the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not given what was due to him. And he was worthy of people's worship, worthy of people's obedience, worthy of people's honor. Yet none of that was given to him. You know, even with this horrific and, um, shall we say, heinous treatment of the Messiah, we are still not to miss the sovereign plan of God. Because in the same chapter of this parable, Jesus states, and I'd like to read to you uh, Matthew 21, verses 42 and following. It goes, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so again, in spite of the darkness of the situation, in in spite of the darkness of the human heart, we are not to miss the silver lining according to the sovereign plan of God. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ would be rejected, But at the same time, he becomes the chief cornerstone. God had intended that through the rejection and death of the Messiah, he would become the chief cornerstone of our salvation. And so by leaving Caesarea Philippi and now moving to Galilee, Jesus was now slowly making his way to Jerusalem to eventually die for the sins of men. Jesus knew his mission, and he was steadfast in accomplishing it. And so, friends, without this darkness happening, we would have no redemption. Without this tragedy taking place, we would have no hope. And that is why, again, in spite of the darkness, in spite of the tragedy, in spite of this heinous crime that was about to take place, there was still something good that was about to happen. And basically, the application, once again, friends, is that there is always a silver lining in the dark times. And why is that so? Because our God is sovereign. He uses the dark times to achieve something that would be beneficial for us or for others. And and that is why, friends, we are never ever to be fully totally despondent. I mean, I know we are human. I know that we are are given to those those sad emotions at times. And at times, we we tend to make mountains out of mole hills. And and during those times, it's so hard to see God. All we see is, is darkness. All we see is tragedy. All we see is affliction. All we see is hurt. All we see is dismay. But friends, never ever forget Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Good is being accomplished. If not to us, then to others. Allow me to share to you a a very beautiful story. The mother of a brain-injured child wrote these 
enabling words. She said, we would have called it the greatest tragedy of our lives were it not for the fact that because of her condition, we have come to know God better. Our keen disappointment when the expected mental growth did not occur cannot be fully expressed. However, it made us understand how God must feel when His children fail to develop spiritually. So out of that situation, they now began to empathize. They now began to put themselves in the shoes of God. And not, they now began to understand how God must feel. When you and I are not, are not growing, when you and I are not maturing, when you and I are not convicted of our sins, and so in this particular case, the injury that happened to the brain of, of this child caused the parents to have a self-realization, even a revelation of God. Yes, friends, the Lord allows difficulties and heartaches in order to enlarge our souls to receive a spiritual blessing that otherwise we could not contain. And so comforted and strengthened, what happens? We come out of each trying experience, bigger and better Christians, and with a new fragrance of grace emanating from our lives. Friends, that is what happens. And that is why, again, as difficult as it is, pain, in fact, happens to be a gift. And I know that it is a gift that a lot of people do not want to receive. But friends, if we just understand things from, from God's perspective, if we just understand things from a biblical point of view, then friends, I believe that we will be more embracing of trials, more embracing of difficulties because we will see the end result. And what is the end result? Well, the end result ultimately is our own righteousness. The end result ultimately is our own spirituality. The end result ultimately is our own spiritual maturity. As athletes would say, when there is no pain, there is no gain. And friends, that is not only true true in the word in the world rather of athletics it is also true in our own spiritual lives i like to share to you the story of my sister in law whose name is loli and she has cerebral degeneration and is she's practically paralyzed and you know it's just a tremendous thing that she looked at her situation as a blessing when doctors began to examine her and do tests on her. In other words, uh, she was made like a guinea pig. And why was she able to rejoice in spite of that? Because she knows that whatever knowledge these doctors have about her or gain over her situation, it can be used in helping others with the same condition as hers. I mean... Look at that mindset. Look at that attitude. Lolly was not thinking of herself, but rather she's thinking of others, that her situation could in fact be a blessing to other people. And when you have that mindset, how, how can you be depressed? You will somehow learn how to rejoice in the Lord and again rejoice. Now, if you have this kind of mindset, you can think and function correctly as a Christian. And with this kind of mindset, you can still have the ability to think about others rather than yourself. And I, I believe, you know, sometimes we, we tend to be so self-centered. We tend to be so focused on ourselves and, and we're not thinking of others. Let us remind ourselves that we were given a second commandment. And what is that commandment? That we are to love our neighbors as what? As ourselves. And then Paul himself, in writing to the Philippian saints, said this. He said that you need to esteem others better 
than yourself. And friends, that can only happen, by the way, if you and I are correct in our perspective, if we are all right in terms of our understanding of a biblical, godly point of view. So let's now switch uh, gears and let's now talk about the coming daylight in verse 23b. And it says here, and he will be raised on the third day. You know, this is what I tell people when, when they're going through difficult times, when they're going to, through adversity, when they're going through depression, I always tell them the narrative has not yet ended. The story has not ended yet. And so you're probably right in the middle of a, a story or a God story about you. And it's going to get better. Of course, it's going to get better if you are at the center of his will. But you and I know that God never abandons his people. He never forsakes us. So in a sense, because it's not the end of the narrative, things will get better. Again, if we are at the center of his will. And we have to see the story of Jesus as not yet, the story of the cross as not yet the end of the narrative. Had Jesus, by the way, remained dead, we have every reason to be depressed, to be discouraged, and to be despondent. Why? Because it would mean we would have no hope. Jesus' resurrection proved that our sins had been paid for, and therefore, we can look forward to our very own resurrection. And that is the wonderful thing that we discover here, friends, that because Jesus rose from the dead, we shall also rise from the dead. And when we experience the resurrection of our bodies, we will enter into a larger life, a more powerful life, a more beautiful life, a life that is without end. And that is why I'd like to describe to you what is going to happen to us at the resurrection. So let me read 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 20 and following. It says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also all will be raised up in Christ. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body, which is to be but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it the body just as he wishes, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Now let me stop there for a while. What Paul is really trying to say is that death is an absolute necessity on our part. This body, this decaying body, this sinful body that you and I have has to die. I mean, how can we be raised up if this body that is decaying continues to live on? And that is why it is of absolute necessity that you and I die, that we might be raised up. And how are we given that assurance that our bodies will be raised up? Well, because Jesus rose from the dead. And so if that happened to him, that's going to happen to us as well. Now, let me just read on and let's talk more about this resurrection body. It says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. Uh, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. Now, what is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that when our bodies get resurrected, it's going to be different. I mean, different in a beautiful way, beautiful in a powerful way, beautiful in a greater way. That's what Paul is trying to say. He is trying to, to 
perk up our, our spirits and it is trying to make us understand the brightness of our destiny, our future, the, the, the beauty of this resurrection body. And so, Again, reading verse 40, it says, There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the, the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For the star differs from star to glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable one, but it is raised an imperishable body. You know, what a beautiful thought this is, friends. You and I know that our bodies will perish, whether we like it or not. But when our bodies get resurrected, it will be an imperishable body. In other words, it will no longer die. It will no longer decay. It will no longer grow old. It's going to be perfect. And it's going to be invincible. Then in verse 43, it says, It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And you and I cannot even imagine the power that you and I would inherit from the Lord. I mean, think about Samson. Samson could, could slay a thousand people. And we're not even talking about a resurrected body. We're talking merely about the empowering of the Holy Spirit upon Samson. And that is why he was able to do something that was absolutely humanly impossible. So if Samson could do that, guess how our bodies would be so much more powerful than the body of Samson himself. Oh, it is so glorious. Then it says in verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And if there is a, a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, what does that mean? I mean... Perhaps one great example would be the Lord Jesus Christ. A spiritual body is, is able to travel at, at the speed of thought. A spiritual body is able to pass through walls. A spiritual body can, can travel in time and in space. And, and we know that Jesus Christ would be from one place to another. I mean, in an instant, in a click, in a snap, he would be there. And so, friends, again, think about the glory of this kind of a body. And then in verse 47, it says, The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthly. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, think about this. Every time there was a human encounter with, with an angel, what normally happens? Well, what happens is, like in the case of John the Beloved, when he saw an angel right before him, he, he bowed his head before this angel. Why? Because the presence of, of this angel being a heavenly being must have been so glorious that John the Beloved was removed out of his senses, so to speak, and he began to, to worship this, uh, this angel. And again, what, what does that speak of? The heavenly body. It's going to be a glorious one. So moving on in verse 50, it says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And, and, and then it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. But in a moment, the twinkling, twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable will put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. So what is this talking about? This is talking about the rapture for us believers in Christ. 
in the twinkling of an eye, try to twinkle your eyes, friends, and you will notice that even when we're twinkling our eyes, I mean, it doesn't seem we are, right? And, and, and that's how fast, that's how quick our change will take place. That's how quick and how fast the rapture will take place. And then all of a sudden, you know, we will have this, this glorious bodies. It says here uh, in verse 53, the perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, we will inherit a body that cannot die. Cannot die. It will not die. We are invincible. It says, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your, your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What a glorious inheritance this is. We can look forward to that time when it will be glory for us. And that is why the application here is there is always light at the end of the tunnel for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And I just like to tell you the story of a, a very godly Christian woman, a prayer warrior who just recently passed away, but she had a wonderful experience before she died because she and her husband were able to join us in one of our trips in Israel. And so let me share to you the story of Sister Anne Buenaventura, who had claustrophobia, and at the same time, she had asthma. So when she went with us to Israel, she was afraid to go through one of the places that we were supposed to go, the, to go through the Hezekiah Tunnel. And why was she afraid? Because it was too narrow. And the thing was, she was really very hesitant, but at the same time, she wanted to experience all there was to her Israel trip. So in spite of her apprehensions, in spite of her anxiety, she braved that tunnel. And after coming out of it, she was beaming with so much joy. She too, by the way, went through a dark tunnel in her life when she battled cancer and she, she braved it as well, just like a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. But eventually, death took hold of her. The good news, however, is that she is out of that tunnel. Already, she is in the bright presence of the Lord. No more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. The old things have passed away. The new has come. And so again, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And again, for those of you who are listening to me right now, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what kind of depression you're going through right now. I don't know what kind of darkness you're going through right now. But remind yourself, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Well, my philosophy teacher did not believe in God because he said he saw the end of the tunnel and there was no God. My friends, what a terrible, huge mistake. No, friends, at the end of the tunnel, God will be there. Hallelujah. God will be there. Now, in verse 23c, we have the present downheartedness of the disciples. It says, and they were deeply grieved. Now, what the disciples seem to have heard was the death only. The word deeply, by the way, is a contrast emphasis and comes from the Greek word uh, spodra, which means all out, exceeding, very much, done to the max. I mean, this root, uh, spot there originally described what was violent or turbulent. So we're, we're dealing about turbulent emotions, uh, emotions that are so deeply embedded in, in darkness, in despondency. And the word grief, by the way, comes from the Greek word lupeo, and 
lupe, uh, one of the root words, means deep grief. So this means to experience deep emotional pain, sadness, severe sorrow. The word is very intense, by the way, and it is used of the pain of childbirth. Now, try to combine these two words, deeply and grieved. And so combining the two Greek words and the contrast emphasis for the word deeply, this will indicate to us that this was not ordinary sorrow. This was rock, bottom, ocean, deep, depression. This kind could make you lose your mind. I mean, that's how, how dark it was. This was how difficult it was for them. And, and, and sometimes we, we reach that point in our lives when we're, we're, at, at, we're pinned at the corner and there's nowhere to look at in terms of you know human resources, in terms of human possibilities. We know that our only hope comes from God himself. And that is why, friends, uh, the situation, sadly, of the disciples was they were not listening well. Because if they had listened well, they would not only be able to hear the word death, they would also be able to hear the word resurrection. And sometimes that's our problem, isn't it? We only hear what we want to hear. And if you happen to be a pessimistic person, you will only hear the dark side of things. But if you are an incurable optimist, which we should be as believers in Christ, we will always see the bright side of things. Now, the application here is that sometimes this is the case with us. We only see the bad side of things and never the good side. And so, friends, this is a lesson for us. Let us not be a copycat of these disciples. And again, this is so true with us. Oftentimes, we complain about the economy, but we do not thank God for the food on the table. We complain about the poor condition of our homes, but we do not thank God that we have a roof to shelter us from the sun and the rain. And this is something that needs to be corrected. We need to count our blessings instead of our trials. I recall the story of a man who complained about his worn down shoes until he saw someone who had no feet. Friends, learn to count your blessings instead of your trials. Now, the way birds react in a storm is quite interesting. The duck is altogether indifferent to the rain, oblivious to its effect. The chicken, however, becomes most miserable, the helpless creature in, in a downpour. But the robin, the bird, sings in the rain, saving its sweetest note for the most raging part of the storm. You know why? Well, here's a story that will tell you why. Well, Russell Spray writes, Glancing out of my picture window, I was impressed by an interesting sight. A robin was busily flitting about in the rain, stopping only momentarily to sing his lovely, thrilling song. Unlike the other birds, this fine-feathered creature wasn't seeking shelter from the downpour, but was delighting herself in the shower. He knew that much valuable food was being made available by the rain, for the worms he sought would be near the surface and more plentiful in the downpour sod. And so, friends, yes, if only we're just like the robin, looking at the bright side of things, realizing that in the sovereignty of God, it will be well with our soul. Then, friends, we will be uplifted. We will be lifted out of our sorrows and our depression and, and out of that darkness, that dark mind that we are in. So similarly, we should look at the blessings instead of the trials. And what greater blessing, friends, than the blessing of our redemption and our resurrection, as this passage teaches us. Oh yes, Christ will suffer, but he will rise again. And together with his resurrection comes our redemption. 
and our resurrection as well. Friends, are you going through a dark tunnel in your life? Is it causing you to lose focus and hope? Is it causing deep sorrow in your heart? Know that because God is sovereign, there will always be light at the end of the tunnel for those who are in Him. Romans 8.28, now we'll close with this. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for the wonderful lesson that we have received today. We are so blessed, O oh God, that we can find hope in the midst of darkness. And what a powerful lesson we have today. And Lord, even though the worst of the worst might happen to us, claiming our own lives, we have a resurrection that awaits us. So we thank you, dear God. And we also thank you that we could partner with you with the work of the Lord as we share our resources, our, 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 our tithes, our grace gifts, our love offerings. Lord, we thank you and bless you. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. It's been a wonderful Sunday, brothers and sisters. So again, please don't forget, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. And incidentally, we'd like to announce to you that we are on Light TV every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. And we are also coming out on FEBC on all radio stations nationwide. We're coming out on DZAS every Sunday from 9.30 to 10 p.m. We hope that you can listen to the preaching of God's Word with us. God bless you all. We'll see you again next weekend. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM, broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 AM to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Zamboanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR-FM 
every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000060800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount. Enter the name LWCCCII and account number 001-0000060800 and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.